Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose. As long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your host, Sean. On this episode, we have another heartbreaking Bears loss, the Blackhawks slumping, and my reflections about the end of the season for the Chicago Cubs. All of this and more on this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. First, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. The Rockford Ice Hogs, the AHL affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks, get to see tomorrow's stars of the Blackhawks today only 90 minutes from the city limits and fun for the whole family. Tickets starting at just $9. Next home game is November 7th against the Milwaukee Admirals. So go see them now. Make sure you see them on November 7th because they won't be back in town for two weeks, uh, which will be November 20th at, oh, I take that back, November 22nd is the next time they'll be back in town. So over two weeks against Lake Erie. So make sure you check them out. Get tickets t-shirts and more at icehogs.com and tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. So I guess I'm going to start with this Bears loss. I, it's weird. As as the different seasons pass, I sort of reflect differently on losses. A couple years ago in the Lovey area, era, I would I would you know sort of take it be uh, devastated about it. I would just be so bummed out about losses, and it wasn't it wasn't really rational. But at the time, they were competing, and they were had a good defense, and it was whether or not the offense could muster enough points. And you felt like they were in most of the games through special team. They were winning two of the three phases and defense and special teams. And I would I would take it pretty rough when they would lose because I just expected them to win. But when when the the Mark Tressman era came about, I just it became sort of laughable because they were just they were just so bad it was it wasn't even funny. And now in the John Fox era, I guess I'm, I didn't know what to expect, and I'd hope for the best, plan for the worst, and I still don't know what to expect. I mean, we're almost halfway through this season, and I still don't know what to expect from this Bears team. Because it's it seems like they could be in a game, and I mean they could easily be what five and two right now instead of two and five. I, I take that back. They could be four and three maybe. Um, I guess they could have won that Green Bay game, the Seattle game, and, and the Arizona game. They were those were no brainers. But I, mean, I guess they technically could have been like five and two, but they're here sitting there at two and five, uh, a top ten worst record in, in football. But they've been in so many games, and they should have won two weeks ago against Detroit, and they should have won this game against Minnesota. I mean, there was absolutely no reason they shouldn't have won this game. Let's let's talk about some of the things that happened in this game. Um, I, I want to start out by saying there's we all think we all know there's three phases in this game. There's offense, defense, special teams, and you have to win at least two of those three in order to to win a game and the offense is starting to click a little bit now that you're getting Alshon healthy and and you've got uh, Jay healthy and 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 you're starting to blend into a little bit of an offensive line even though it was just shuffled up today uh, your offense is is beginning to start to click a little bit uh, the defense has its ups and downs but the special teams has pretty much been consistently down. I mean, when when we're championing the uh, the special teams because they don't give up a touchdown, that's sad. And they've given up three return touchdowns already this year, which leads the NFL. I mean, this they gave up the third one today. 
so between uh, I guess we'll start though with Mark Mariani who's the Bears return man on the kicks and punts and he muffed two back to back balls and you can't have that if if you're a kick return in the NFL that's that's a number one rule is catch the ball I mean Bill Parcells if he was in this coaching staff he would have yanked him off the field by his throat and not let him back in there but the the Bears team they they keep putting him back out there and trotting him out there there's other guys that can go out there and catch the ball Marquise Wilson is one of them I don't know if they're worried about needing him to to be a wide receiver that that they're afraid and they they're just going to keep him out there because there are other options uh, that they've had at kick returner of either off the team or injured and Mark Mariani's what's left. Maybe that's their thinking, but it, Mark Mariani is uh he was a fumbleuski today. And another issue I had with him is um Mark Mariani is is not the guy that's going to take a ball from the back of the end zone and return it for a touchdown. That's not going to happen. He doesn't have the skills or the speed to be able to do that, and the Bears don't have the special team's blocking ability to open up a lane for him. So when they kick the ball in the back of the end zone, why is he bringing it out? Just take the ball at the 20. I mean... Best case scenario, you're going to get maybe to the 25, 27 yard line. But that's best case scenario. You're not going to take one of the house. So you might as well just not get anybody injured and just kneel down. It, it, it's so infuriating. Uh, but that's on the, the receiving end. Let's look at the, the kick return for a touchdown today. And if you watch, it's no deal off yield. And they left them, never even got touched. I mean, what you want to do is is break off your blocks, go down, seal the edges, and force him back to the middle of the field where you usually have, uh, it's less likely that you're going to have an open lane to run through, and you're going to have more people trying to tackle him. Don't give him that that wide open lane. You have to get off your blocks, and that's that's something the Bears don't do. I mean, they don't do it on special teams. They don't do it on defense. It's, they, they have to get off these blocks. This is just, it's unfathomable that they that they do this. And the Bears, the last two years, had an awful special teams coach in Joe D. Camillus. And I figure that by getting rid of him, that we'd, we'd see some improvement in the special teams. And I, I don't think we have. I, I really don't. I mean, I granted is we're so used to having Dave Tobe, who is the upper echelon of, of special teams coaches, and the the players and the he puts everybody in a position to do good things, uh, have great coverage on kicks and punt, uh, you know, punts and kicks, and then you had Devin Hester, the greatest return man of all time, with one of the better special teams coaches you know, of this time and magical things happened, all kinds of magical things happened. And so I get that's, that's a pipe dream that we won't have anymore, but you know, that's, that's far fetched to, to believe that we could get that back and catch that magic and get that lightning in a bottle again. It's not so far to imagine that we could bring somebody in that's going to get the guys in the position to not give up touchdowns on kicks and returns. That's what we're asking. Is is it, it's it's as easy as this. When you get kicks and punts, don't fumble it. When you are on uh, coverage, is don't give up a touchdown. It, no, nothing spectacular. If we keep it to a draw on special teams and just use it for good field position, like to change the field position, then. Lo and behold, there we go. Life is good. But then again, that's not what we have. So it's, um, you know, it's something we have to deal with. And then in the coaching staff, I don't know what's going to happen come the offseason. I mean, we're stuck with this guy for the whole season. They're not going to fire a rookie general manager and a veteran head coach are not going to fire a assistant coach in the middle of the season. If you start doing that, you're the Detroit Lions. Um, 
what else? Uh, I guess we start on offense. I was actually fairly impressed with with the Bears' offensive line. The, the, the Minnesota Vikings have a top five defense right now, and I knew it would be a struggle to, to move the ball and, and be able to do some of the things. And Adam Gase, at, uh, at first I wanted to jump through my TV and choke him out. It seemed like he was he was coaching to not get a job, head coaching job. Uh, so many just runs right up the middle. Um, a bunch of running plays that were long developing plays. And, and a lot of screen passes. And the Vikings defense sniffed it out, and they were too fast, and they weren't moving the ball. And eventually what they figured out was they exploited a weakness. They found that uh, that their corners couldn't cover Alshon Jeffrey to save their life. So there the Bears go. Alshon here, Alshon there. Oh, they're going to double-team Alshon? We're going to throw a touchdown to Alshon. And that's what the Bears did. And that's that was awesome to see because that's what – Bill Belichick and the Patriots would do. They would find your weakness and they'll keep hitting your weakness over and over and over and over again until they run up the score and that game ends or you figure out how to stop it. And this isn't, and a lot of coaches, they try to overthink themselves. It's if they feel like, well, if I go to the well too many times, it's, it's not going to work anymore. And that's really not reality. It's, it's you make them you make them stop you if if they can't stop the run then you just keep running and running and running and running and running and you're going to win the game for the most part that's you exploit weaknesses that's how you win you find where your strengths are and you try to minimize your weaknesses and maximize their weaknesses and, and exploit their weaknesses you know preferably with your strengths uh, and the Bears, that's what they did. Is they 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 gave the ball or they got the ball to Alshon, and that was that was a huge part of their game plan. Uh, but the offensive line uh, started off by playing well, and it was there was a a big amount of shuffling on there. Is you still have Jermon Bushrod, who's out with God knows whatever injury he's got. You know, still the concussion, the back, the shoulder. Uh, he's just walking hospital report but uh jerron bushrod is still out so you have charles leno jr in there uh you have kyle long at right tackle solid stay steady in there uh Hronis gasu got hurt in this week's training or in this week's practices so they move matt slawson back to center and instead of just filling his hole they move vlad dukas from the right side to the left side to fill for slawson's spot and then they move patrick omame into the vacated Vlad Dukas spot. So what you wound up with from left to right was uh, Charles Leno Jr., Vlad Dukas, Matt Slauson, Patrick Omome, and uh, Kyle Long. And I was really nervous about that because considering that the, the Vikings defense and this offensive line that hasn't played together yet – uh, there, so there's no time to gel. That their run off, their run blocking would be spotty, and their their pass blocking would the communication wouldn't be there. And for the most part, is Jay Jay had some pressure on him, but it was an overwhelming pressure. And the Bears were able to get some some amount of running in there, much better than they have in previous years. So it it was actually pretty impressive. Is uh, every combination that they've been able to, that they've mustered out and 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 drug out and threw out onto the field over the season has been fairly okay. So it's going to be nice to see once you get a full healthy offensive line that what they're going to be able to do once they play a few games together, and that when you got uh, you know the right side of the line gelling, you've got. Ronis Grasso back at center, Matt Slauson there, and you figure out what you're going to do at left tackle. And the Bears are going to have a, a situation at left tackle, and they're going to have to make a decision because Charles Leno has played pretty well. Jermon Bushrod has not. And Jermon Bushrod, I mean, he's a former pro bowler, but he has not been the guy that we thought he was when we paid him. 
and, and he's still making good money. I, so it's don't be surprised if if the Bears decide a to get rid of him at the end of the season, and b they're going to put Charles Leno Jr. over there at the left the left tackle spot. So it's it, it's a decision the Bears are going to have to make sooner rather than later because I uh, I believe. I believe uh, Jermon Bushrod is expected to be back in, in not too distant future. Oh yeah, so yeah, the, I thought the Bears' offense in the second, were probably from the middle of the second quarter, all the way through the rest of the game, I thought they played pretty well. But in the beginning, they had too many run plays that that were long developing plays, um, rather than than having allowing Matt Forte to just hit the hole. And, and do it uh, that way. And I felt that they, um, you know, the Bears' offensive line wasn't able to hold those blocks for long enough to have a long developing play. That they had to do things that were quick to hit those holes quick, and that that was much uh, better. Um, you saw several direct snaps, and that was weird because it, it seems like the Bears don't have a lot of success when they when they run those type plays, but yet they they still try to throw them in there and. It, every time Matt Forte keeps the ball and just runs, so it's not really like it's shocking anybody. I think when once they see it, they go, "Oh, Matt Forte is just going to run uh, from a direct snap," and you don't you don't get any sort of productivity. You're not faking them out. You're not you're not really doing anything other than having an extra blocker in there. Let's see that the first sack that was on on Cutler. They made it. The announcers sort of made it seem like it was. It was Charles Leno's fault, and if you read the uh, the Twitter comments, it seemed like that way too. But I went back and I, I a lot of these plays, I'll go back and rewatch it and rewatch it. And I wish, I wish sometimes I had the the coaches' tape views to see other angles. But it, it looks like you know Leno did not hold his block long enough. But it was Kyle Long's block that got missed that that created. That basically forced Jay to step up in the pocket and step into the guy that Leno, that Leno had the bad block on. So it was a, it was kind of a combination of Leno and, and uh, Kyle Long. But uh, I think if Kyle Long would have held his block, that um, Leno's man would have kind of gone around him, and Jay would have been able to, uh, been able to stay in the pocket. Um, that's. There was one of the few actual bad breakdowns of the offensive line, but it was something I want to note. Or I wanted to note that it was Kyle Long who's who who wasn't uh, as effective in the pass blocking game. Um, and again, there was too many screen passes, too many short passes. I get that uh, this this team is has injuries and and things like that, but when you're facing a tough defense is you got to sort of stretch it out a little bit because if they're a good defense and they they pin you down as a one-dimensional team they're just going to to wreak havoc on you and when you don't stretch the field that's sort of what you are is a one-dimensional team is screen passes and and run plays are in the same category all things near the line of scrimmage so what they're going to do is they're going to block the box they're going to put eight guys up in the box and they're going to put pressure on the quarterback. They're going to stop the run. And they're also going to snuff out. They're fast, they're fast enough defense where they're going to snuff out any sort of screen plays and things like bubble screens, whatever it may be, and, and, and deal with that. Uh, so it was nice to see when the Bears finally started to open it up a little bit and really test those defensive backs. And they found that they did have success when the offensive line was able to hold and give Jay Cutler time is he was completing passes. Uh, you had some to Marty Bennett and Alshon Jeffrey, even Marquise Wilson in there. Uh, Eddie Royal's the only one that didn't seem to have success, and, and he ended up with leaving the game with a knee injury. I believe it was a knee, but he left with an injury. And you also had Forte leave with an injury. And we'll sort of have to wait those out and see kind of the the severity of them, but Eddie Royal's from what I'm hearing is uh, is not going to be bad, and he's going to be back probably next week. And Matt Forte, it's, it seems like it's an MCL issue and not an ACL issue, which can still be bad. Uh, I believe I believe Le'Veon Bell from the, the Pittsburgh Steelers, he's out for the season with, a, with an MCL injury. Um, so if you're, you're 
Matt Forte, you're really uh, you're really praying that it's not a bad or injury. But from what I'm hearing, it's it's a, just a sprain and not a tear, and he's probably going to miss minimal time. Uh, but we have to wait to see what the MRI results are. Uh, the good news is he did leave on his own power and walked off. So that's hopefully it's contusion or or uh, or something like that or sprain rather than rather than an actual tear because that's going to end his season rather than just put him out for you know two maybe three weeks. Uh, but we'll see from there. Um, and then I guess one last thing I want to talk about with the offense is that. You know, Jay Cutler's still thrown off that back foot, but his throws are much more accurate. Uh, he did have that beautiful, beautiful throw for a touchdown to Alshon Jeffrey, where there's two guys on him, and he went up and, and came down with it. And that was that was a great throw because it, the only person that could catch that ball was Alshon Jeffrey. Nobody could take that away. Uh, there was no interception. It was either going to be a touchdown or an incomplete pass, barring any sort of weird thing like. Alshon went up to catch it and tipped it and got caught, but it was it was a great positioning of the throw and it was it was, it was a nice catch. And some of the uh, some of the other internet uh, you know Bears media people were posting that they were noticing Jay Cutler was underthrowing a lot of balls. I mean I could be dead wrong on this, but I really think that that's part of the maturity process and something that the quarterback coach and and Adam Gase are trying to work with him because. Jay Cutler's problem is when he starts sailing the ball. That's when he's getting his interceptions. That's that's what he's doing. And um, typically, you're going to get less balls intercepted when you're under throwing uh, than you are over throwing, unless you're throwing to Alshon Jeffrey in the end zone. But uh, I, I really think that that's part of something he's worked on is to to under throw it a little bit because your guy's going to be the have the much better option of getting it. And again, I could be dead wrong, but I would be willing to, to bet that that's, that's true. And uh, you know, barring Jay Cutler going on, on the radio or in TV interview and, and saying otherwise, you know, it's always going to be up for speculation that you know, it's either just shorting it by bad mechanics or if he's actually attempting to, to make the ball go throw it a little lower because there's more likelihood that your guy will catch it. Now let's talk about this defense. Ah. So we're at the point where the Bears offense can compete to win one of the phases of the three in the game. The special teams is probably not going to win you win that battle anytime soon. So in order to, to be a team that wins games, you need to win two out of those three phases. And this defense is going to have to step up because it's going to have to be the offense and defense. It's not going to be special teams that wins wins that phase. And this Bears defense had, I like to say they're out kicking their coverage. It's kind of like when you have a mediocre and ugly guy and he's got a super hot girlfriend that you're like, how the hell did he do that? And, and that's what you need to see out of the Bears is uh, you want to see a, a result that is better than the, the sum of its parts. You want that, uh, you want to be able to look at this defense and be like, well, they've got, they've basically got Pernell McPhee and a bunch of nobodies, uh, has-beens and never was, and they're playing this awesome defense. That's really what you want to see. And that's not what you're seeing. And the one thing I can say is that they're much, much, much better coach than they have in the last two years. And I think I, I harp on this every single week that you you don't see them getting just absolutely wrecked and they're able to make stops even against the the better offenses but it's there's just so many plays that define the game for them and last uh, or against Detroit you had at the end of the game a safety a undrafted rookie safety covering Calvin Johnson Megatron and, and when you knew that they were going to try to push the ball to get downfield because they had to score, and there you, you had it is Megatron makes the catch, and, and they come down there to win the game. And the same thing happens the very next game is you have Antrell Roll, 
trying to cover one of the wide receivers for the Minnesota Vikings and give us up a long play. And it was, I, I, I'm watching, I'm watching the play, and it's, it's almost like Antrell Rolls not even trying to make a play on the ball or anything to, to defend it, to intercept it. It's just like he's giving the guy free reign to make the catch. Al, uh, Al, Antrell Roll is a veteran. He he can't be doing that. Uh, and so it, it's mind knowing to see that happen. Um, then you have your, I mean, I guess we're all wearing the defensive backs. You've got Kyle Fuller, who in the beginning of the game is making some fantastic plays, you know, diving to, to make breakups of passes and good defending passes and good coverage of the the hot young rookie receiver for the Minnesota Vikings and you're like wow you know I actually tweeted out it's how uh what I write um how Kyle Fuller got his groove back or something like that it's a play on the movie title and it, and that was it was good to see because I think Kyle Fuller has the talent it's it's the psychological thing for him so it's a uh, you it was nice to see him start to see get that confidence back, and then he makes a boneheaded play where he doesn't he completely misses an interception because he's playing the man instead of the ball, and it's like he forgets to turn his head, and, and or he just forgets his his technique sometimes, and then it's you wind up with a bad play, and that could have easily been a pick six on Kyle Fuller's part because he's got enough speed that if he would have caught that ball, bam, gone. He's going to outrun Teddy Bridgewater. He's going to outrun that offensive line, and he's going to make down there for a touchdown. Instead, the Lions get – I mean the Lions. The Vikings get the inter, or they get the completion, and, and they march down the field. Um, who else? Uh, you've got Sherrick McManus who, at this point, I'm a pacifist, but I really want them to drag that guy out in the back and – just beat him with a stick. Sherrick McManus is a veteran at this point, and he's made so many negative plays this season. I can't understand why the coaching staff keeps putting him out there. They keep trotting this guy out there to embarrass himself and embarrass the city, embarrass the team. And it was – he was the one that gave up the touchdown. He had poor coverage on a speedy receiver – I mean, absolutely poor coverage. I don't know why he was covering him in the first place. And he completely whiffed on a tackle from his poor coverage. And the guy easily trots in to get a touchdown to tie the game up. Sherrick McManus shouldn't be on this team. I've said it a couple weeks ago, and I'm going to repeat it now. Is Sherrick McManus doesn't belong on this team. It's, it's sickening. The only defensive back that's that's been a standout has been Adrian Amos. And that's that's fantastic to see because he's been the best safety the Bears have had probably since Mike Brown. And that's been a while now. That's been like a decade or more. Uh, and Adrian Amos is, I mean, he's still, he's still got room to go because, I mean, he came in there and blitzed on Teddy Bridgewater and whiffed on a sack. So he's still got room to grow, but he's been making so many positive plays that he doesn't even seem like a rookie out there. He's not He's not getting burned in coverage. He's being where he's supposed to be. He's making the tackles he's supposed to make. And it's really nice to see because he was a late-round pick. And it's good to see that that's going to be the way that you are, if you're the Chicago Bears, you're going to close the talent gap on some of the teams that are way ahead of you, like the Green Bay Packers, is you've got to be able to hit on later draft picks. I mean, if you're just hitting on your first round picks, that's something, but it's you've got to be able to hit on a few. And you have a Ryan Pace with his first NFL draft. Kevin White, the the jury's still out because he he was injured. But if he's anything like I expect him to be, that's gonna be absolutely phenomenal pick. Second round, Eddie Goldman, he's looked good. He's your starting nose tackle on one of the most important pieces on a on a 3-4 defense. So great. Hronis Grasso is going to be your starting your starting center. Uh, Adrian Amos looks good. I mean, you've you've got you seemingly have hit on multiple draft picks in your very first draft. That's great to see. But you've got a lot of room to go. Um, you know you can't compete 
long term with the Green Bay Packers where you are right now, with the talent level you have right now. But that next milestone, that next marker that you had to be able to do was to beat the the next best team in the in the division. And we thought that was going to be the Lions, but it's turning out to be the Vikings. So the Vikings are that next benchmark of where you at to measure yourself. And the Bears aren't that far off. They were able to compete. They were able to put points on the board against that tough defense. They made a lot of stops. But when it came down to it is the Vikings the Vikings are still a better team and the Bears have some room to go to go to be able to compete with that level. And that's that wild card contention type level. Um, and that's the Bears aren't there yet. The Bears are still a uh, a non-playoff team caliber. Um, let's see. We've gone through the defensive backs, the linebacking, the middle linebackers. Um, meh. They did okay. But this is the defense, the outside linebackers and the, the defensive line, they they left a lot to be desired. Uh, you're not getting you're not getting the pressure on the quarterback that you really need to generate with this three four defense, is when when you've got guys like Sherrick McManus out there and playing cornerback and you've got so many injuries out there, and and whatnot. It's you you can't you can't leave those guys on an island with wide receivers for that long. You need to be able to generate pressure. You can't get coverage sacks. You're going to have to actually generate pressure, force the quarterback to throw earlier. And the Bears' defensive front's not doing that. And looking at the run, they've been pretty good against the run so far. But then they came in, they ran into Adrian Peterson, who is steadily becoming one of the all-time great NFL running backs. And he comes in there, and he's just... You know, he traipses through and gets to the second level so many times. He's getting past that, past the defensive linemen, past the linebackers, and it's safeties and cornerbacks that are coming up to to wrap up and make those final tackles. And you can't have that. I mean, granted, they didn't give up any huge runs to Adrian Peterson, but they were giving up. I I haven't looked at the numbers, but I guarantee I can almost guarantee that he had over five yards of carry against the Bears. All right, I actually just looked it up, and Adrian Peterson had 20 carries for 103 yards, so 5.2 yards a carry. So that that's what it looked like. Is not, They didn't give up anything huge, but they gave up steady chunks and steady chunks. And I, I granted it's Adrian Peterson, and it's hard to bring him down right away, but you've got to, you can't give up 10, 12-yard runs to him. You've got to be able to contain him. You've got to make... You've got to, if you're not going to make the tackle, at least hang on and, until you can get a second or third or fourth guy in there to, to drag the, the man down. Um, they didn't get that push up the middle. They didn't. Uh, they were The Vikings offensive line was exploiting, exploiting the A and B gaps for the Bears, which is a little disheartening. And that's running right against the heart of the that defensive line that has been pretty good at stopping the run. You know, part of it is you're, you lost Jeremiah Ratliff, who's a very good defensive lineman. Um, and part of it is you've got guys that are out of position. Part of it is you've got, you're bringing in new guys to uh, like Ziggy hood and such to, to come in there and make these plays. And, and they're, they're just not doing it. You're, you're on your third and fourth options here. And I don't know if it's a doghouse issue or not, but doghouse injury, whatever it is, is I didn't see Lamar Houston out there. And if you guys did, please let me know because I was trying to keep an eye out. But without going back and, and freeze framing every every snap, um, I was just trying to glance and see numbers. Is I didn't see Lamar Houston out there on a defensive snap. And if... You know, if anybody can send me the snap counts of, of everybody, that would be great. But I don't think he was out there, and I don't I don't know if that would have helped the Bears at all. I don't remember seeing Will Young out there either. And maybe the Bears need to do, to do a better job of, of rotating in players. Uh, maybe they need to do to get pressure is take a guy like Lamar Houston who can play 
defensive end in a 3-4 or outside linebacker and put him in there as a defensive end to generate a little more pass rush because he's a better pass rusher than Jarvis Jenkins. Uh, but whatever it is, is the Bears need to be able to generate more pass rush to try to protect and, and mask some of the the shortcomings of the, the defensive backs. Um, anything else I wanted to mention? Uh, lack of pressure. Um, yeah, the the Bears don't blitz very much either. I, it was one of my notes. Yeah, and the Bears the Bears had a nice blitz today with Adrian Amos that he'd missed the he missed the tackle, but um, it did create the pressure that they really wanted. And the Bears are probably one of, if not the uh, least likely team to to send a blitz in. They're really expecting the pressure to come from their defensive linemen, those outside linebackers, and they're not generating that. And it's it's crazy to me because uh, the the uh, Johnson, who I think was Jimmy Johnson, is that his name? The def old defensive coordinator for the Philadelphia Eagles uh, in the early 2000s. He's since passed away. But that guy, I mean, when I lived in Philadelphia, I would always see Eagles games because that's what was on. And watching them, they had a defense that wasn't that good, but they always seemed to perform better because he would gamble a lot and throw blitzes from all over the place. And when you come with predictable blitzes, of course the the offensive linemen's gonna are gonna pick it up and you're gonna may you're gonna be a little bit stuck because you're gonna have less guys out there in coverage and you're exposing those guys to uh you know to to bad plays. And but he would bring all these exotic blitzes and you never knew they were gonna come from. I mean you would leave quarterbacks that were super shell shocked because they were had a you know, they would it almost seemed like that they were sending a 12th guy out there sometimes with these number of crazy blitzes and where they came from. And it would be nice to see the Bears do a little more blitzing until they're able to figure out how it is to get pressure on the quarterback with just just your defensive line. Is You're going to have to send a few blitzes here and there, uh, whether they be well-timed ones and not as often, or maybe they're going to be a little more often, but try to disguise them better or have them be exotic blitzes where, you know, sometimes it's off the corner, sometimes it's the safety come in, maybe the middle linebacker comes in, uh, whatever it is to to at least keep them off balance and, and try to get pressure on the quarterback. If for nothing else, at least on third downs to try to get that off, uh, off them off the field. Uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about as far as the Bears offense. Sorry, it just popped into my head. It's... The Bears have still struggled to to convert third downs, and that's that's a mark of a good team. Is if you're able to get a good, consistent number of third down conversions, because that's how you're going to keep drives alive. That's how you're going to run the clock down. That's how you're going to get keep your defense off the field and keep them rested. And keep if you're competing against the Tom Brady's and and Aaron Rodgers's, like you. The best way to, to stop those guys is to never let them on the field. Is run ten yard or a ten minute drive, keep them off the field. That's the way you do it, and the way you do that is third down conversions. I mean, this isn't a quick strike offense like if you watch the uh, the Giants versus the Saints game today, where the quarterbacks combined for thirteen touchdowns, thirteen touchdown passes. Like those are quick strike type play offenses. They're they're marching up and down the field. You know they don't need they don't get to third downs because they're they're getting first downs on first down and second down. This is a Bears team that's meticulous going down the off uh, down the field. They are very methodical. They they're gonna go for big plays whenever it's they're available, but they're gonna try to use uh, short and mid passes and a lot of runs to be able to get the ball down the field. And they're gonna have to utilize first, second, and third down to try to get those first downs. And that, in order to get those, you're going to have to start converting third downs, and the Bears aren't doing that. And that's that's one area that they have to vastly improve. If that's like 
that's what's separating their offense from being a good offense from being a mediocre offense is that ability to convert on third down when it's necessary. And I guess that's really all I have to say about the Chicago Bears. It's uh, and I mean the guess the reason I'm not, I'm sort of tranquil about about this loss and, and not beating myself up and and being bummed out and upset and whatnot is that really this is a rebuilding team. This is a team that you know the worse they do, the better the draft pick they're going to get, the 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 better the waiver picks they're going to get. Uh, you know they're they're still going to clean house. They're going to get rid of more guys. Hopefully they get some compensatory picks, and you know if they can they can wind up with eight or nine picks in this draft, then then they're in business because they're going to have better draft picks and they're going to be able to to keep churning this the bottom of the roster and adding talent on the top of the roster and and hopefully next year they have something you know to show on the field. Uh, so let's the, move on to my beloved Blackhawks. All right. So let's put this all into a reference frame. First of all, I get it. There's a lot of turnover because of salary cap issues, uh, trying to navigate those types of waters where you're financially constrained, um, that there's gonna be turnover. I get that. Uh, there's also the factor of they played a lot of hockey, a lot of hockey, a lot more than other teams. And going through the Stanley Cup Finals and winning it is just emotionally draining, physically draining. I, I get all that. And this is a new team that's that's tired still from <laughs> coming from a big win, you know, Stanley Cup win and a lot of new teammates uh, all that's not lost on me and it's the beginning of the season and it's a very 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 long season it's 82 games so uh, the, the the struggles that they had are not unexpected and they're not something that I'm worried about it's just something I you just don't like to see but it is something that that it's not unexpected so I mean, looking at it from where they're at currently in the season is if the season were to end today, they would be in the playoffs. Granted, they would be in the eighth seed, but they would be in the playoffs. And the, the odd part about it is of the eight teams that would make the playoffs right now, uh, it would be six of them are in the uh, wait, one, two, three, four. Yeah, six of them would be in the Blackhawks division. So they're behind Dallas, St. Louis, Nashville, Minnesota, and Winnipeg all in their division. Uh, the only ahead of Colorado in the division. But uh, you've also got a major, major injury to Duncan Keith where he's out for several weeks, which is going to throw a monkey wrench in everything that you've had already. And this has been a team that's been uh, very up and down of, of how they're playing. Uh, for several games, it was the offense couldn't click, couldn't score any points. Then the offense started scoring, but the defense was giving up a lot of fast breaks, a lot of a lot of bad shots. Uh, it was just it just wasn't indicative of what they've the defense that they've played over the last several years. So, uh, you know. Since the last time uh, we recorded, uh, the Blackhawks they they beat Florida three to two in a tight one, one to nothing against Tampa in a tight one, uh, one nothing against Anaheim in a tight one, uh, then three one lost the the other night to Winnipeg, and then Friday night was a five four loss to Minnesota, which is just ugly. You, you don't want to give up five goals to Minnesota, uh, and whenever anytime you give up, you're the Blackhawks and you score four goals. You have to expect to win that game. And, uh, I mean, the defense had an off night. The Blackhawks gave up f several odd man rushes. Uh, they struggled to get Minnesota out of their zone. Um, there was a bunch of mental lapses uh, at, the, at the beginning of end of periods, which has been plaguing the Blackhawks since for a long time now. 
And I mean, then you have the the Minnesota Wild score two goals early and. Oh. Sorry, I'm old and yawning. The Wild scored two goals early in periods, uh, 18 seconds into the first and 32 seconds into the third, and another one, 11 seconds left in the first. So you, you're giving up cheap goals in the beginning of, of periods and giving up cheap goals in the end. And that's usually a Corey Crawford type move, but, but Scott Darling was in the goal. Um, you've got Jonathan Taves. He, he's finally starting to pick up the offense and playing well, uh, which is which is good to see because there was a, a a period of a couple games in there where it looked like there's something was wrong with Johnny Taves because he, he wasn't on the wasn't on the first team power play. He wasn't he wasn't playing well. Just not really something you expect out of Johnny Johnny Taves after the the years that we've spent with him. Um, uh, Artem Anisimov, he's continuing to contribute. Um, you know. You, People keep asking when we're going to see Marco Dano in the team, uh, but um, you know he he was the centerpiece of that trade that that sent Brandon Saad over to Columbus, and he's been playing like like the guy that we expected to get. Uh, he's what the Blackhawks needed immediately, second line center that they desperately needed to fill that void that they had, and uh, you know he scored his fourth goal of the season on Friday. He's just not. Um, he's just not like a second run guy on that second line. He's not just the the guy that's with Kane and, and uh, Panarin. He's a worthwhile member of this this team in that line. So that's that's good to see uh, seeing Anisimov play well. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I mean, the the Blackhawks are a team that's still trying to figure out. Who's going to be on this roster? Who's going to be in all the Lions? And now that Duncan Keith is hurt, they're still they're really trying to figure out who their defensemen are. Um, I mean, they weren't really on a roll when he was there, but now that he's not there, it's definitely it's definitely hurting. Um, you know, they're going to have to figure out how to get, play cohesive defense. For the next couple of weeks without Duncan Keith, I mean, granted he is he's back to being back on skates from what I hear, but he's still a couple of weeks away for from being able to go out there and play on the ice. Uh, and you add in there that Marion Hosa has an injury. I mean, granted it's it's a they're saying it's day to day, but it's lower body injury, and, and who knows how long he's going to be out? If it's one game, two games, no games, a week. Whatever it is, uh, you add that to the Duncan Keith issue, and and this team is uh, this team is already struggling and trying to find their way. And any time lost with your big name guys is not going to help anything. Um, you know, the 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 other night, the way the off uh, the lines were, you had Taves and and Hosa and and Tikhanov were on the first line, and that that line's playing fine. Uh, the second line has been good with Anisimov. Uh, Kaner and Panarin. Uh, that fourth line has been consistent for you know since the end of last season. Desjardins, Kruger, and, and Shawzi. But it's that third line that's just been complete shuffle and shuffle and shuffle and shuffle. And you know it's uh, you've had different guys on there every night. And that last game was Brian Bickle, Tanner Caro, who came up from Rockford, and Ryan Garbutt. And they keep wanting to recycle guys and, and, and throw guys into the mix in that third line. But the one consistent guy they've had in there is Brian Bickle. And it's so infuriating because Brian Bickle is the reason that line is failing. It's when they they threw him up in the first line and, and, and we're hoping that he would come out of his funk playing with Jonathan Taves and Marion Hosa. And really he just dragged down Marion Hosa and Jonathan Taves. It's it's he's a guy that's completely lost his way, and I don't know how many warnings they're going to send the guy before they finally just do what needs to be done and send him down to Rockford. It's he he's not capable of of being an NHL caliber player and contribute on any line, let alone uh, a line that you need to be, uh, you know, a, a scoring line. 
it it's it's really sad that they just keep giving this guy chances i mean he didn't when he was healthy scratch at the end of last season for most of the playoffs that didn't sink in with him uh when they when they uh put him on waivers and he cleared that didn't get the message across to him uh, i mean clearly messages aren't getting across to the guy just send him down be done wash him off your books it's you know it's nothing personal against brian bickle this is the fact that if you're a team that's already struggling to figure out your identity you've got injuries and you've and you're trying to uh you know right this ship before before it gets too late in the season and you get what you had after they won the first cup where they they fight and scratched and clawed to make the playoffs and they were just spent by the you know, by the end of the round of that playoffs you don't want that you want to be able to to rest going into the end of it and and get your guys healthy and and be mentally prepared for that grueling taxing uh, stanley cup playoff run and the sooner you get rid of brian bickle the sooner you can figure out who it is on your team and who's going to mesh well i mean they keep they keep rotating guys out of this third line like it's their fault and and yeah maybe they're not playing the best but it's it's hard to play well when you have Brian Bickle on your line. It's just he's a magnet for for, for bad news. Uh, so it's it's something that Quinville, you know, he's as great of a coach as he is. He's got his shortcomings, and one is he's going to stick with certain guys until the end. Uh, and then you've got your defensive pairings that are just a constant in constant flux. They were. You know, trying to figure out who your your last pair was, and then you have Duncan Keith, who was a stalwart of your your defense, and and he gets injured. So now the first the first pairing has been Svedberg and and Seabrook, and the second pairing Jalmerson and TVR, and that third one is Daly and Runblatt, and, and that's really not a defensive pairing that you want on the ice a lot. Uh, so, I mean, honestly, none of these pairings are are ideal. And none of them are going to get you what you had with last year with Jalmerson and and Oduya, and over the last several years with Seabrook and Keith. Is you don't get you don't get that uh, that tough play and that that synergy that you have with the pairings. These are just happen to be two guys that are out on the ice, and 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 it takes a little bit of time to work with each other, and and it doesn't help that. You know, Daly and Runblatt aren't nearly as talented as some of the other guys, and Svedberg isn't either. Is you know, none of those guys can hold the jockstrap of Duncan Keith. So this is really going to be a kind of hang on moment until you get Duncan Keith back, and then after at that point, it's going to be trying to figure things out. So in that meantime, all you can do is is try to stabilize that third line, and and put the first two lines in position to score. And, and try to right the ship a little bit is win with some offense because you know you're going to be able to, you're going to be giving up some goals on some breakaways and, and miscommunication and things that happen when you have a less experienced defensemen and defensive men that that haven't played together as much um, but again it's the long it's a long long season and they're still just in the beginning of it so this is this is not anything to panic about at any stretch of the imagination. It's just, uh, I mean, they had won three in a row before these two losses. It's just going to be, it's a slow and steady wins the race. Is you got to keep improving, keep getting better, and avoid long losing streaks and, and try to put together as many wins as you can. And that's, and that's where, uh, you know, the Blackhawks have to do, get to and, and, and figure out their footing and figure out what their identity is and, and get to that point. Um, I guess that's all I have for the Blackhawks. And the final thing I want to talk about is just, uh, I mentioned last week that um, I wanted to give my reflections about the Chicago Cubs and, and the season that they had. And I didn't think that last week was appropriate because I had some some strong emotions just because of the way that season ended. But really, if you think about it uh, and sort of reflect on it is... They're a really great team, and they ran into a a really hot team, and 
and that hot team just happened to exploit all the weaknesses that the Cubs had and the Cubs inexperience and, and rookiness and, and their flaws started to come to light at the wrong time. It happened. It was uh this was not a this was a team that I hoped to be about five hundred that they could make a little bit of noise and rattle some cages and with some teams like the Giants and the Cardinals that are perennial playoff teams. I figured they that they would try rattling a little cages and 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 get those teams thinking, man, what are we gonna do to hold off the Cubs? And instead, you had a Cubs team that beat down the doors and won 97 games and made the playoffs and and ended up being in the 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 NLCS. That's phenomenal, especially considering that Anthony Rizzo is one of your veteran guys and he's like 26 years old. Um, you have Addison Russell as a rookie, as a major contributor. Uh, Chris Bryant is a rookie, major contributor. Kyle Schwarber as a rookie, major contributor. Uh, Jorge Soler, who's basically a rookie, as a major contributor. It's you've got that many young players contributing, and then you know Javi Baez coming up at the end. That's that's unheard of. You don't have a team with that many rookies, that young of a team that comes out there and plays like that. And uh, it's it's been the longtime philosophy of, of Theo Epstein is that the way you win is that in every single position, all nine positions, you have you have somebody that's above average. So you, you want them to have a, a wins against replacement, which if you're not familiar with what the wins against replacement are, it's there's some sort of complex mathematics that, that they do that figure – Versus if you had the, the average, statistically average player on there and you replace them with the guy you have, is how many more wins would your guy get over what the average replacement would be? So you have to have a positive wins against replacement to uh, to at every single position to be a team that wins a World Series. And I know I've talked about this before, but I went back through and after the completion of the season is Anthony Rizzo has a 5.5 war wins against replacement. So it means he single-handedly is worth almost six wins. Starlin Castro is a 0.8. Javi Baez, 0.5. Addison Russell, 2.9. Chris Bryant, 6.5. Miguel Montero, 2.0. Kyle Schwarber, 1.9. Dexter Fowler, 3.2, and Jorge Soler, 0.1, Chris Goglin, a 3.3. Uh, and then you go to your starting rotation. John Lester's a 5.0, Jake Arrieta is a 7.3, Kyle Hendricks is a 3.4, Jason Hamill's a 2.4, and Dan Heron was a 0.3. So you did have that recipe where every single position had somebody that had a positive war. I mean, granted, right field was a little bit ha ha with Jorge Soler, but I. He's still a positive war, and and he proved his worth in in the playoffs. So it's, I mean, you, you can't be mad at this team. You can't be sad at this team because they they went out there and they overachieved. Sure, it's heartbreaking that they didn't win the World Series. It's the closest we've been in a long, long time. It just, you know, this we were playing with house money right now. It, it, we. This was not something anybody expected. This was a bunch of young kids maturing much faster than anybody expected. I mean, a year ago at when the playoffs started is is Kyle, uh, Kyle Schwarber was finishing up rookie ball. He would just been drafted. He played some rookie ball. And then he just whizzed right through the minor leagues and right into the majors and, and, and just crushing the ball off of guys like, you know, Noah Syndergaard, Jason, or, or Jacob deGrom. Like, it, that's not what happens. That's not what's supposed to happen. You have Chris Bryant winning Rookie of the Year, running away with it. He's 23 years old and just the poise that he has. Uh, it, Addison Russell... Everyone thought he was two to three years away, and he comes up just a couple months later 
and and he looked like a deer in the headlights for a little bit, but he he showed what he could do. You saw glimpses of it at times. I mean, with with the leather, he was lights out. Uh, they statistically rank him as one of the top four best fielding shortstops and one of the top four best fielding second baseman in all of baseball. So with the leather, he's undeniably good. And with the bat, he's just starting to figure it out and, and f- learn what he's able to do and, and how to do it against these major league savvy pitchers. Javi Baez even looks like a completely different guy than what we saw last year, where he just came up there arrogant and strikeout machine. This Javi Baez is different. Sure, he's going to have his strikeouts, but he's up there and he's being productive. And then once he gets on the base path, is he's a decent runner and he's a good fielder. You, you know what you're going to get from him. And he can play second base, shortstop, third base. Uh, so it's a... Uh, the Cubs have the Cubs have a lot of places where they're just they're set for next year. I mean, of course they've got to get better if they plan to win a World Series because they ran into that buzzsaw. And uh and Theo Epstein and Jed Hoyer have a lot of tough decisions to make because they've got a lot of talented guys that don't have a home. Um Javi Baez very very talented guy we saw that some of the things he can do but then it came down to is where does he play he plays he's a you know he plays second short and third at second base you've got addison russell or uh starling castro who's signed to a long-term big money deal at shortstop you've got addison russell who's your future guy at third base right now you have chris bryant who's won rookie of the year who does he displace there and what do you do with the guy that he's displaced uh, you say, well, we know we're losing Dexter Fowler, or we don't know. Dexter Fowler is a free agent. We possibly could lose Dexter Fowler. So maybe maybe move Chris Bryant to, to uh, center field. Is he capable of doing that? Is he a good enough fielder? Uh, do you really want to have an inexperienced guy playing a new position at center field while you have Kyle Schwarber in left and Jorge Soler in right. That's that's not the defensive outfield that you really want to, to be competitive in baseball. Um, and then you you have Chris Coughlin, who was a good performer for you this year. I mean, he had a 3.3 wins against replacement. That's pretty darn good. Uh, he's not even a starting outfielder now. He's a spot starter. You know, he comes in sometimes for Jorge Soler. Sometimes he comes in for Kyle Schwarber. And then you have Kyle Schwarber. If the National League had a designated hitter, that's the place he goes. But you need a bat like that in the lineup every day. I mean, the guy is just crushing balls like he's Babe Ruth. He's he just, I mean, devastating home runs. You have to have his bat in the lineup. Is it, but where do you put him in the field? He showed versus the Mets that he's a liability in the outfield. You know, granted he didn't play very much, but he's he's going to have time to practice in the off season and work with coaches and and on his own to improve his fielding. But still, he's he's a liability in the outfield. Um, and then you look at your starting rotation. Beyond John Lester and Jake Arrieta is. Jason Hamill had a disappointing second half of the season. Kyle Hendricks has been up and down. Dan Heron is retiring. It's, it's, what are you going to do with that rotation? I mean, sure, you can you can have four starters back, but are those the four? And then you need to find a fifth. But wouldn't you love to find two starters and be able to replace Jason Hamill? Because God knows what you're going to get from him. And... And you have to replace Dan Heron anyway. So that's a. And we saw in the uh, the playoffs when you couldn't, you couldn't start Arietta and Lester every game. It's, you don't have the the pitching that that the New York Mets had. You can't just throw your main two guys out there every game. It's, the way those games are spaced, you can't do it. You're gonna have to go with four starters in there to make, to make it to the World Series and win it. You could just get rid of that fifth guy. So, 
So what happened to the Cubs? Why were they so great in the regular season and then fizzle out against the Mets? And the answer is the Cubs lived in, I mean, the Cubs didn't hit for a high batting average this year. They struck out a lot. And we all knew that. That wasn't something that was news to anybody. The thing that they did, though, was they compensated by having a high on-base percentage and a high slugging percentage. So what that means is they didn't hit the ball a lot or the high percentage, but they got a, a lot of walks. And when they were hitting balls, they were getting doubles and triples and home runs and, and bringing in runs that way. I I have to pull the statistics on this, but they have to be one of the leaders in baseball of of the number of pitches that they see per at bat. And where that is important is the Cubs would work the count and they would drive up the pitch count on the starting pitcher and knock him out early. And when you're playing a team in a three game series is you're pushing to that bullpen so early that you're you're seeing guys the bullpen guys from the fifth, sixth inning on, and that that depletes the team, that other team's bullpen. And what are the odds that you have your starting pitcher that's aces and your middle relief be aces and your closer be ace and, and be able to shut you down? It doesn't happen that often. Some At some point, the more pitchers you see, you're going to find a weak link and you're going to be able to put them some runs on the board. And that's what the Cubs, where they took advantage, is sure they struck out a lot. Sure, they didn't hit for a high average, but they worked the, I mean, everybody worked the count. Anthony Rizzo works the count. Uh, Addison Russell works the count. Chris Bryant. Starlin Castro is probably the one guy that doesn't work the count, and he was uh, one of the better hitters on the Cubs. So it's uh, that's the magic that they had. And you had a guy like Jake Arrieta, who was just unbelievable this season, and John Lester, who despite some rough outings, had put up some good numbers. But once they ran into the Mets, the Mets exposed them for two of their ma- three of their major weaknesses, strikeouts. Is They got a ton of strikeouts on those young Cubs hitters. They put them in counts. They, uh, you know, they were throwing strikes, and the umpires were giving them big strike zones. So there was, they were getting ahead early in the count, and those Cubs hitters were trying to protect the plate and, and ended up striking out on, on big pitches. And so the Mets, they were staying out of of full counts and, and long pitch counts and throwing a lot of strikes and getting the Cubs to chase. So that's one. Two is when the Mets got base runners, they were stealing bases, stealing second, stealing third. I'm surprised they didn't steal home. But that's what happens is they... Uh, is they would get runners on and they'd advance the runners by base stealing and then sack flies or scoring runs, singles or scoring runs. Uh, all these things are scoring runs and the Cubs aren't able to do that. So their pitchers need to be better at, at holding guys on. And finally, it's uh, inexperience on defense and, and, and lapses in defense and, and not having the most stellar defense is Solaire had a big error in the outfield. You had uh, Kyle Schwarber get exposed in the outfield. You even had Dexter Fowler getting exposed in the outfield. Um, Javi Baez with a big error in the infield. Chris Bryant with some errors. It just, you had errors on top of errors and, and the Mets team just took took advantage of that. And so these are all, these are all things that are fundamentals you can work on. These are things that your young players are going to get better at as they as they improve their skill and then baseball becomes easier for them. Uh, you're going to cut down on strikeouts. I mean, look at Javi Baez from last year to this year. It greatly improved. Chris Bryant, they're going to work hard on him to fix that hole in his swing. He's always going to be a big strikeout guy, but they're going to cut down on that. Addison Russell is going to cut down that on that as well. And you could see the number of strikeouts he had decrease as the season went on. Um, and and that's that's what the Cubs are working on. And, uh, and then again, they also, the lack of pitching depth. And that's something that Jed Hoyer and, 
Theo Epstein are going to work on in the offseason. So basically, sum it up is, yeah, I was really sad to see them lose, and especially against the Mets, who I can't stand. And I would have loved to have seen the World Series and, and all the accolades that go with it and that feeling of, of winning and that we've never felt with the Cubs. But this was playing with house money. This is this is a team that way overachieved that nobody expected 97 wins out of. Uh, 81 wins? That that seems about right. But 97? Come on now. That's, that's just absolutely ridiculous, and, and it's great to see. And and you can't you can't just expect because they did this this well this year with this team and how young they are that just by having all those guys mature another season that suddenly they're going to be right there in the National League Championship Series again next year. This is a it's a long season. A lot of things happen. And look at the Giants. Uh, you know, go from World Series champion to not making the playoffs. It it's it's tough in baseball. It's really, really tough, and a lot of things are out of your control. And the Cubs can't rest on their laurels. They're going to have to improve in the off season, and they're going to have to, they're going to have to improve their roster. And individual players are going to have to keep improving themselves if they if they want to keep uh, being like the Braves of the '90s. They where you're a perennial perennial team of uh, making the playoffs and winning the division. And that's my reflections on the Cubs. Uh, I'm going to talk more about some hot stove stuff in the next couple weeks. Uh, hopefully have a guest on where we can talk about the Cubs and some of the moves they might make as well as the White Sox. But I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Thank you guys so much for listening. And uh, if you are listening, make sure you are subscribing on however you're listening, whether that be iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, however you're listening, just hit subscribe, leave comments, feedback, uh, anything to make sure you know we know anything we're doing right and wrong, and spread the word to your friends. It's always good too. And I know this was a little bit of a boring episode. I'm sorry. I was uh, uh, with Halloween weekend and my daughter's first time going trick or treating and and work being out of town for work and such i just uh didn't have a lot of time to prepare so i apologize for that i will be better next week and thank you guys so much for listening i greatly appreciate it and until next time bear down what a lucky break the good lord wants the cubs to win we thank dick and god for all they have provided cubs win Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like number New Yorkers. Smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears! Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.